Many, on both sides of the Atlantic, are haunted by conspiracy theory. That is because we are all victims of the Cold War. Nobody realises that the Russians fought on two fronts, military and psychological. Distracted by the fear of nuclear annihilation, we have been under covert psychological attack since the last war. The Russians themselves have made no secret of their activities. So-called defectors from the KGB, such as Yuri Bezmenov, have spelt out the strategy. I've put a link to his videos in the sidebar. He clearly states that the object of the KGB has not been espionage, but to demoralize society to such an extent that no one is able to defend the interests of themselves, their family, or their country. Every aspect of society has now been affected. Government, civil service, business, mass media, the law, education, and medicine. Doctors have played a fundamental reassuring role in all societies since the beginning of time. As a doctor myself, I have helplessly watched the ideological subversion of clinical practice, which started in Britain in 1948 when I was a schoolboy with the inception of the National Health Service. By forbidding them from charging patients, family doctors lost the freedom to perform minor operations or pursue particular interests. They were no longer free to suture lacerations, for example, and my father had to junk his x-ray machine. Ninety-five percent of people who do not feel very well and decide to consult their doctor can still only be assessed by clinical judgment. Any blood tests, x-rays and other scientific investigations that are performed to clarify the diagnosis are invariably negative. The big unknown in modern medicine is not cancer or heart disease, as everyone has been led to believe, but the cause of all those niggling nerves, coughs and collywobbles. Everyone suffers collywobbles at some time or another, regardless of race, religion or social class. Occasionally an individual becomes abnormally anxious or hypochondriacal about such symptoms, perhaps spooked by something they saw, heard or read. They become obsessed by the notion that there is something more seriously wrong. It is the commonest problem for which patients seek advice. In Britain, before the NHS and until the reforms of 1968, Reassurance was available from any GP next morning, next afternoon, or next evening. To be examined and reassured, patients simply sat in the surgery and waited their turn. Then in Britain in 1968, in order to promote the dignity and status of the workers, doctors were induced to adopt appointment systems. Patients could no longer pop into the doctor on the way home from work they had to make an appointment. Five minutes were set aside for problems that could be resolved in a couple of minutes, so that appointments quickly became fully booked. Patients were fobbed off to tomorrow or the day after. In effect, the cheapest, quickest and most effective reassurance for the commonest clinical problem in the world became unavailable. Hypochondriacal anxiety became bottled up and brooded about, with patients resorting to self-medication. The modern market in alternative medicine was created. But there have been far more serious and expensive consequences. Doctors have long had medical legal liabilities. They could be sued if they left instruments or swabs inside people after operations, for example. The comrades have been active in America since the days of Lenin. Five or six decades ago, they started promoting litigation for errors of judgment as well as errors of practice. Since doctors have far from perfect knowledge, this was far below the belt. The doctor-patient relationship is based on mutual trust. Not only must the patient trust the doctor, the doctor must trust the patient. Doctors became unable to trust their patients.
to safeguard their livelihoods, they had to put medical legal security above the welfare of patients. Increasingly, patients were referred for expensive confirmatory investigations so that in the event of litigation, the doctor could say he had substantiated his judgment. But when a doctor suggests a need for further investigation, the hearts of patients, who are already in a hypersensitive state, leap into their mouths. They fear there is something seriously wrong. Instead of immediate reassurance, they have an anxious and demoralizing wait, often lasting weeks, to get the results. Patients feel worse rather than better. It was this elementary clinical psychology that was subversively exploited in America and later the rest of the world with ever more expensive consequences. The effect was not only demoralizing but also sometimes lethal. In my book I describe a case in Canada in 1964 where a patient asked me outright whether I thought she had heart disease and promptly had a heart attack when I told her the truth. I stabilized her before moving her to hospital where she made a complete recovery. But when I told him, my supervisor was livid. To avoid any medical legal comeback, I should have bundled her into an ambulance where she would certainly have died. The upshot of such circumstances was the development of intensive care. Medical legal pressures then ensured that such units were used for the prevention of death rather than the saving of life. The effect was to produce ever more helpless and expensively dependent cripples. The elderly were similarly treated. Fearful of being sued by relations if they died, patients got treated with antibiotics for what should have been their last illness. They then survived to become geriatric vegetables, again making massive demands for care and depriving families of their inheritance. Healthy people, fearful this might happen to them, began vainly writing living wills. Afraid of being sued for the untoward consequences of infection, antibiotics were administered even for trivial infections. This speeded the process of antibiotic resistance, creating MRSA, C. diff, and a host of other untreatable bacteria that have yet to emerge. A recent spell in hospital myself led me to suspect that all medication is now prescribed for medical legal rather than clinical reasons. The promotion of litigation has been a clinical and social disaster. It has destroyed trust and massively increased costs. The expenditure on medical care in America is legendary. It is reported that the National Health Service now costs a hundred billion pounds a year. But lawyers are not qualified in medicine. Moreover, no matter how mighty the laws of the land, the laws of nature are mightier, and it is the laws of nature that determine the course of illness. By allowing themselves to be bewitched by the comrades, it is lawyers, not doctors, who have been professionally negligent. If the people want affordable health care, they'll have to sack their lawyers. The elimination of subversive medical legal expense would massively reduce the demoralizing cost of health care. For more detail, download my book, More Than a Puff of Smoke. The link is in the sidebar.